our speaker, Richard Wolfson is Benjamin F. Whistler Professor of Physics Emeritus at Middlebury College. His BA in Physics and Philosophy is from Swarthmore, his Master's in Environmental Studies from the University of Michigan, and PhD in Physics from Dartmouth. He researches the sun, climate energy, and so climate change and solar energy. His books, Nuclear Choices, A Citizen's Guide to Nuclear Technology, and Simply Einstein, Relativity, Relativity Demystified, exemplify his interest in accessible science. He's written several textbooks and published in Scientific American and World Book Encyclopedia, and you may very well know him having produced six video courses for the Great Courses series. Rich Wolfson is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Here is Professor Richard Wolfson. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> it's great to be here and welcome to everybody. Um, <clears throat> I didn't see all the names coming in, but a special welcome to Steve Lindemann, whom I haven't seen for many years, and to my poet colleague, Gary Margolis, who loves to write poetry about science, particularly about space type things. So this is a talk that <clears throat> was inspired by events that took place in 2015, um, but it's based in part on my book, Simply Einstein, which in turn is based in part on the first of the video courses I did for the great courses. And that in turn is based on the course Physics 101 that I taught for many, many years at Middlebury College. So this, uh, the roots of this talk go back a long way. Now that course was a whole semester. The video course was 24 lectures and my book is a couple hundred pages. And so I can't really do justice to my topic in the 45 minutes I have but I'll do the best I can. I won't give you all the details of relativity, but I will give you a nutshell of what it's about. And I will emphasize particularly general relativity. So let me get started. Um, back in 2016, February 2016, a bunch of news broke that gravitational waves had been detected confirming Einstein's theory. Then there was a second set of waves. These were from colliding black holes, a third merge, a third wave detection, another one. And eventually this led in 2017 to the Nobel Prize in Physics to the uh, researchers who developed LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which I'll say a little bit more about. Gravity waves are still in the news. Um, here's what they look like uh, on the data screen. And this is what they sound like. And what you're hearing in that sort of what you were hearing in that sort of chirping noise was the black holes spinning more and more rapidly together as they spin together in shorter and shorter orbits and eventually merge. Now LIGO results continue. Here's a catalog of events now from 2020 um, that was published in 2020. And let me just get my laser pointer going. No, not working. Uh, and in this uh, picture, we see there are many, 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 many black holes merging that have been detected. Uh, and there have been some neutron stars merging that have been detected also. And I'll say a little bit about what these things mean before I get into the essence of relativity. Finally, I told Bob when he contacted me last week that I had some newer, newer news, but that was from April. Now I have some news from May. Uh, Physics Magazine just two days ago published this article about how uh, we get messages from neutron stars by combining gravity wave and x-ray observations of these bizarre objects, which I'll mention a little bit later. And before I get into the essence of relativity, let me just tell you about LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It consists of two uh, huge structures that consist of uh, two and a half mile long arms at right angles. One is in Livingston, Louisiana. The other is in Hanford, Washington. And they uh, send laser beams out and back along these arms and they can detect differences in the lengths of these arms about, the 10, 000, about a 10 thousandths the diameter of a proton, a remarkable piece of technology. They're joined also now by a third detector in Italy, which makes it uh, much better for pinpointing where objects are coming from. I'm not gonna describe how LEGO works. I could give you a whole talk on that, but I'm gonna move right on now to the relativity theory, that, which is behind these gravitational waves and everything else that Einstein had to tell us about the universe. So uh, relativity in a nutshell, um, relativity is really an utterly simple idea. And that's what I wanna get across in this talk. It's the idea that it, motion doesn't matter. Nobody has a claim 
to being moving and nobody has a claim to being at rest. There is no special state in the universe which comprises being at rest. And to say I'm moving is a meaningless statement unless I say I'm moving relative to something. Another way to put this is that the universe works the same way for anyone, regardless of their state of motion. So if I'm doing an experiment about physics, I get the same results you do, even though we may be, uh, I may be in a spaceship going at 90% of the speed of light relative to you, which phrase I have to add because motion itself doesn't mean anything. Another way to put it, the laws of physics that you discover by doing experiments don't depend on your state of motion. That's it. That's really the essence of relativity. The laws of physics don't depend on your state of motion. The universe, that is physics, the fundamental science that describes the universe, works the same for anyone regardless of their state of motion. And I want to motivate this by giving you, uh, first of all, a very simple experiment that I think you'll agree with me uh, gives you some confidence in believing what I've just said here. So I'm going to talk about tennis because I think tennis is basically a physics experiment. I mean, think about it. You're banging the ball back and forth. You're applying forces to it. Gravity is acting on it. It's really a physics experiment, even if you don't couch it in those terms. Now you can play tennis on earth and it works fine because you understand the laws of physics as they work on earth. And you'll notice I've replaced Einstein's picture here with Isaac Newton because Newton understood what I'm saying in this set of slides about tennis. He's gotten almost to relativity, but not quite, just with the what we talk about here. Now imagine instead of playing tennis on earth, you're on a cruise ship once they're allowed to sail again. And um, <clears throat> you're playing tennis in a tennis court, which is on the cruise ship. Uh, let's make sure it's enclosed so you don't have to worry about the wind that arises from the ship's motion through the atmosphere. And you play tennis on the cruise ship. And the question is, do you have to think about, oh, the cruise ship is going in this direction and therefore when I hit the ball that way, I got to worry about that and take that in. You don't have to think about that at all. The tennis game goes exactly the same way on the cruise ship as it would here on solid earth. Again, the physics experiment of tennis works the same way in both places. Now let's go to Venus. Now Venus is just about like earth. It has the same gravity. It has, does not have the same atmosphere. So we're gonna put you in this bubble here on Venus, which has earth's atmosphere and other characteristics. Now Venus is, um, millions of miles from Earth, tens of millions of miles from Earth, and it's moving relative to us at uh, many thousands of miles a second. Certainly a different state of motion than Earth. And yet I think you would agree that if I went in this uh, bubble on Venus with a tennis court in it and tried to play tennis, it would work pretty much the same as it did on Earth. I don't have to worry about the fact that I'm on Venus and it's moving rapidly relative to Earth. Earth isn't that important. What's important is the way physics works in the universe. And if you agree with me on all this, and Newton would also, let's go to a different place. Let's go to an Earth-like planet in a distant galaxy that's moving rapidly away from Earth. And by rapidly, the fastest things we see out there, the fastest galaxies are moving away from Earth at more than 80% of the speed of light. Do you think somebody playing tennis on that Earth-like planet in that distant galaxy has to worry about the fact that they're moving at 80% of the speed of light relative to Earth? or equivalently, Earth is moving at 80% of the speed of light relative to them. If you want to claim it does matter, then uh, Copernicus would turn over in his grave because Copernicus believed the Earth was not a special place in the universe. And to claim that everything else that happens in the universe is pinned to the motion of Earth is, is absurd. So um, I think you'll agree that this tennis experiment works the same pretty much everywhere. And that's the essence of relativity. The, Laws of physics are the same for anybody, regardless of their state of motion. And all physicists from Newton's time on, Newton and Galileo understood this. That idea is called Newtonian or Galilean relativity. It's also Einsteinian relativity, but it's Newtonian or Galilean also, because they, they knew this. <clears throat> now I wanna do a different experiment, which is only slightly more complex, it sounds like. I'm going to... Um, get done playing tennis and I'm gonna take my cup of tea. Can you see me? If you can see me, I've got my cup of tea holding up here. And I'm gonna put the tea in a microwave and microwave a cup of tea to warm it up. And I claim that's also a physics experiment. It's a physics experiment that involves a different branch of physics though. It involves uh, electricity and magnetism, which are what make the microwave work. And I think you'd agree that the physics experiment of heating my tea in the microwave is gonna work on earth 
just as well as it would on a cruise ship, just as well as it would on Venus, and in fact, just as well as it would on an Earth-like planet in a distant galaxy moving rapidly away from Earth. Even though microwaves are basically light, I still don't have to think about, oh my goodness, my, my microwave oven is moving at 80% of the speed of light relative to Earth, thousands, billions of light years away, and I have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about that. But physicists at the end of the 19th century thought that the microwave experiment, they didn't have microwave ovens, but they did have electricity and magnetism. They thought that would behave differently. They thought there was only one place in the universe where that kind of physics would work. And I think from our 21st century perspective, that sounds a little bit absurd, but it was that dichotomy between one branch of physics, electricity and magnetism that seems to obey, uh, that doesn't seem to obey a relativity principle according to the 19th century physicists versus mechanics, the motion of a tennis ball that does. So let's get back to our relativity in a nutshell. Motion doesn't matter. The laws of physics are the same regardless of your state of motion. And that's what Einstein said. Einstein said <clears throat> all the stuff that Newton and Galileo believed applies to all branches of physics, mechanics, electricity, and magnetism. None of it depends on your state of motion. And he formulated in 1905, the special theory of relativity, which basically says that the laws of physics don't depend on your state of motion, as long as you're in uniform motion. And what I will not get into at all in this talk is the fact that special relativity overthrows our common sense notions of space and time. But the idea behind special relativity is so simple that it's fairly straightforward to come to these logical conclusions that space and time are not what our common sense notions tell us they are. So special relativity has some really bizarre implications, but it's grounded in this utterly, utterly simple statement that the laws of physics don't depend on your state of motion. Then 10 years later, roughly, Einstein published his general theory of relativity that removes that restriction and says physics works for any state of motion. And general relativity is much more complicated to understand mathematically. Einstein actually had to learn some new mathematics to develop the theory. And I would say far fewer physicists are fluent in general relativity than are in special relativity because it's still an unusual theory, although it's now the basis of our understanding of the large scale physical universe. So how did Einstein get to this general theory of relativity? <clears throat> he started with special relativity being restricted to this special case of people in uniform motion, observers, people who do physics experiments, people who look at their watches or whatever. Uh, as long as they're in uniform motion, special theory of relativity, fairly straightforward and easy, tells us that uh, they all observe exactly the same physics. But why should your state of motion matter at all? Einstein asked. Uh, why not physics, laws of physics are the same for all observers, period. And really that statement is the statement of the general theory of relativity in its essence. The special theory says laws of physics are the same for all observers as long as they're moving uniformly. General relativity just takes away that restriction. The laws of physics are the same for all, period. There are also some problems with special relativity. <clears throat> it turns out it's not so easy to know if you're in uniform motion. It's actually difficult. You could think you're in uniform motion and you're actually not. There are some problems with Newtonian gravity. Um, Newtonian gravity is inconsistent with relativity because gravity acts instantaneously over a distance. In that sense, if the Earth suddenly disappeared, the moon would immediately stop moving in its orbit and go off in a straight line. And uh, Einstein's special relativity says that's not possible because no signal, no information can travel faster than the speed of light. So Newtonian gravity is inconsistent in that sense. And the gravitational force in Newtonian gravity depends on how far objects are apart. How far is the moon from the Earth? Well, that determines the gravitational force that holds the moon in its orbit. But then when do you make that determination and in whose reference frame? Because space and time in relativity are different for different observers. And finally, there's a problem with reference frames. That, by that, I mean something in some state of motion that's being accelerated. Uh, an example would be a car going around a curve and you feel sort of thrown to the outside of the car. Or you're in an airplane accelerating down the runway and you feel thrown back into your seat. Um, and 
you feel heavier in that airplane and you could be confusing the acceleration of the plane with being in a region where gravity is a little stronger and points in a different direction. You can't tell the effect of gravitation, of, of acceleration from gravity, it turns out. And so Einstein had in 1907, what he called his happiest thought. It's called the principle of equivalence. And he published it on this, in this paper in 1907 on the relativity paper and the conclusions drawn from it. So here he's two years after his special relativity, but still uh, seven, 16, nine years from general relativity. <clears throat> and he commented on this paper in 1920 with this quote, the gravitational field has only a relative existence because for an observer falling freely from the roof of a house, at least in his immediate surroundings, there exists no gravitational field. And I want to elaborate a little bit on what that means. So here I am in a little box-like structure. Um, you could think of it as an elevator if you wanted, but it's got no cable or motor or anything. It's just a box out there in space. I'm in uniform motion, which means I'm just moving along without any acceleration. And I'm so far away from anything. That's why I'm in intergalactic space that there's no gravity. And so you see me floating around in this little chamber because there's no gravity to pull me down. And if I take a ball out of my pocket and let it go, it just sits there because there's no gravity. Now here's a situation that mimics that. I'm on earth, I'm in an elevator and someone's cut the cable. Woe to me when I smash into the ground. But before that, I'm falling freely the elevator is falling freely, and the ball I take out of my pocket is also falling freely. And as Galileo purportedly showed when he dropped his uh, rocks off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, all objects fall with the same acceleration, regardless of their mass, regardless of how big or heavy they are, neglecting air resistance. They all fall with the same acceleration. So when I take the ball out of my pocket in this freely falling elevator, it just sits there and I, feel I can float around in the elevator. And um, it feels to me exactly like the situation of no gravity in interstellar intergalactic space. So free fall in gravity and intergalactic space are equivalent in that sense. I can't, can't tell just from experiments I do in this little box which situation I'm in. Now, the, the situation of the box falling toward Earth is going to be fatal for me. However, I can do the same thing by going into free fall in an orbit around Earth, and that's what happens to astronauts. They seem to be weightless, apparently weightless, in their space station or space shuttle or space rocket, whatever they're in. And people think, well, that's because there's no gravity, but that's nonsense. There is gravity. Gravity is keeping them in orbit. Otherwise, they'd go zooming off in a straight line, and we'd never see them again. What's happening is they're in free fall. And in free fall, that is when you're moving under the influence of gravity alone, you don't feel gravity. Now here's another equivalent. If I'm at rest on earth and I take that ball out of my pocket and drop it, it accelerates downward. On the other hand, if I'm in intergalactic space with no gravity present, but I strap a rocket motor onto my elevator and I fire it so it accelerates in the upward direction here at the same acceleration that something would fall on earth and I take the ball out of my pocket and let it go, it's going to appear to me to fall to the bottom of the elevator. It isn't quote really falling. What's really happening is the elevator or rocket or whatever it is, is accelerating upward and beating the ball. And you'll notice in both these cases, I'm firmly attached to the floor. In the one case because of gravity, in the other case because of acceleration, and we can't tell them apart. So that's the principle of equivalence. It says the effects of gravity and acceleration are indistinguishable. However, there's a caveat. And the caveat is that that indistinguishability is true only in a small enough region of space-time. Space-time is the four-dimensional continuum that comprises both space and time, and it's the essential stage in which physics plays itself out in relativity. And when I say a small enough region, I mean a region that encompasses a small enough space in space and also a small enough uh, interval of time. And I'm gonna give you an example of a situation where you can begin to distinguish the effects of acceleration and gravity. So here's my same elevator. It's in free fall now above the earth, that big green thing is the earth, or maybe it's a black hole or something. And I'm very big, so I extend over a large region of space and time. Well, I see artist Olson coming in and I know her from centuries ago. Welcome. Um, 
So here I am and I'm going to fall and something interesting is gonna happen here. I'm taking these two balls out of my pocket and the elevator and myself and the balls are all gonna fall. And they're gonna fall of course toward the center of the earth because that's the place where earth is attracting from or acts like it's attracting from. So they're gonna to fall toward the center of the earth and that means they're gonna fall not on exactly parallel paths. So here they come downward toward the center of the earth and you'll notice they're converging slightly as they fall. So a little bit later, um, we're down here. The balls are a little bit closer together than they were. They were that far apart originally. Now they're a little bit closer together. It's as if some force has squeezed them together, but it hasn't really happened that way. We know looking at this picture, what's happened is they're falling on paths that are not parallel. Now, if you look very closely, you'll notice something else has happened. Um, I'm no longer as uh, wide as I was because I've been squished a little bit, just like the balls have. And you'll notice something else. I have also been stretched in the vertical direction. And that's because my feet are a little closer to the earth's center than my head. And so they feel somewhat stronger gravity. This sounds a little complicated. By the way, this is called tidal forces because it's due to the differences in gravity from place to place, not to gravity itself. And that's what causes Earth's ocean tides. It's the difference in the moon's gravity from place to place, not the gravity itself. If it were the gravity itself, the sun's gravity is far stronger than the moon's. But the moon's tidal effect is actually about twice as big as the sun's because it's the differences in gravity from place to place that cause these tidal forces. And Newton and Galileo and many others knew about these also. But what Einstein did is to grab on these tidal forces and look, we can't make this effect that I'm showing you here go away by jumping into free fall. So there's something in the large scale of space and time that distinguishes gravity from acceleration. So the principle of equivalence only applies in small limited regions of space and time, but in big regions, and here it's big compared to the curvature of whatever object I'm falling toward, earth or a black hole or whatever, uh, then um, we can distinguish acceleration from gravity. So now Einstein has something he can pin on, pin gravity on. And so the foundation of general relativity is this principle of equivalence. All objects fall with the same acceleration and you can't distinguish the effects uh, of acceleration from gravity. Um, and you don't therefore feel gravity in a freely falling frame of reference, as I said before. So if I just stand up on my chair and if I were teaching a live class, I would do this right now. I'd stand up on the table or something and I'd jump off. And during the brief second or so that I'm falling, I don't feel gravity. Well, relativity tells us that anything that can be gotten rid of by going to a different state of motion, a different frame of reference can't be real because the laws of physics have to be the same for everybody. And if there's gravity, everybody's got to see it. So what isn't gravity? Gravity isn't something that's present in one reference frame, but not in another because relativity tells us all reference frames, that is all states of motion, a cruise ship, a planet moving away from Earth at some high rate of speed, a spaceship in orbit. All of these are equally good. And if gravity is present in one of them, but not another, that can't be something that is real and objective. So you don't feel gravity in a freely falling frame of reference, that elevator with the cut cable, the space station orbiting in free fall around the Earth. So what you usually feel is gravity can't be objectively real. Now that's a hard one to swallow. I'm sitting here in my chair and I feel my butt pushing down on the chair and I feel my chair, chair pushing up my butt. Isn't that gravity? Well, no, it isn't. Um, what is gravity is something that would be there even if I fell off my chair while I was falling. And for Einstein, gravity is these tidal forces, these differences in what we used to call gravity from place to place because they can't be transformed away by jumping off the table or going into free fall in a space station, space station or whatever. So they're the real manifestation of gravity. So Einstein searches around now to find out some way of describing or uh, objectifying this gravity that he claims is real. And the essence is this, what is gravity? Einstein answers, it's simply the geometry of space-time. It's the geometry of the universe we live in. It's the, uh, curvature of a four-dimensional space-time. Well, what on earth would make space-time curved? Well, Einstein has an answer, matter and also energy because according to special relativity, these are equivalent. And 
how do objects move? They move in the straightest possible paths in curved space time. Those paths are called geodesics. And locally, they're straight lines. You only see the curvature on large scales. It's like this. If you're in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, and you want to go to uh, somewhere else that's up there, um, Elmore, where there's a great nursery, you want to go to Elmore, Vermont, well, that's not very far. And you go there, and it's basically a straight line. You don't notice the curvature of the Earth. But if you want to go from St. Johnsbury to Beijing, you will find yourself traveling in a curved path. That's the straightest possible line on the surface, the two-dimensional surface of Earth. And it's the same for relativity, except it's in an unimaginable four-dimensional space and time. So general relativity in a nutshell is this. Matter and energy tell space-time how to curve, and the curved space-time gives matter its marching orders, how it's to move. And we physicists are fond of diagrams like this that sort of takes a rubber sheet and distorts it. We have a demonstration of this at the college. We look down on it with a video camera so the students don't see the bend in this thing. But if I roll a ball along this curved sheet, if I roll it fast enough, it just deflects a little bit from its straight line path. If I roll it closer to that object that's distorting space time, it goes in an orbit. These uh, diagrams are a little bit misleading. And I like to use a diagram that is a little less misleading and one that I think gets it a little more correct. So I'm going to talk about curved space-time in the context of Earth's orbit in space. So I have here a diagram that shows uh, Earth going around the sun. And you can imagine this gray surface as being um, a two-dimensional slice of space. And it happens to be the plane in which Earth's orbit is. And people hear about curved space-time and think, oh my goodness, look how curved it is because the Earth goes in this orbit. And that's a very common misconception, and that's nonsense. Because it's not space alone that's curved, it's space and time. And I really need to think about what Earth's orbit looks like in space and time. And so as Earth goes around the sun, it's staying in the same orbit in space. But it's moving forward in time. So it's going to look something like this. I took the Earth and the Sun away, but that's what the path of Earth looks like. It goes around in space and it moves forward toward the future in time. And it takes a year for it to go around. It advances a year in time when it goes once around its orbit. That's the definition of Earth. So this still looks like pretty curved space time. But here's the point. Um, the distance around Earth's orbit is tiny compared to the distance that light travels in a year. And so this picture is very, very out of scale. And a real picture would look something like this, only even the spiral you see would be even uh, less obvious. And that's what I mean by the curvature of space-time. And Earth is in a region where space-time is simply not very curved. So when you think of curved space-time, sometimes, oh, the Earth is in an orbit because of curved space-time. That's true. But the orbit itself is not the curvature of space-time. It's the orbit in space and time. And it's almost a straight line for Earth because Earth is in rather weak gravity. In fact, let's look at gravity as Newton and Einstein understand them. Um, when we're in a place where gravity isn't very strong, and that's everywhere in the solar system, then general relativity and Newtonian gravitation don't differ very much in regions of space-time where gravity is weak. And gravity is weak everywhere in our solar system. So either theory works pretty well. So if you want to predict the motion of the space station or the moon or Mars, you probably don't need general relativity unless you have to be absolutely precise. I suspect they used a little bit of general relativity to get the rover to Mars recently, but probably didn't need very much of it. Um, some of the cases where you might, an example is the GPS system. The GPS system is so sensitive that um, differences in the gravitational field that the satellites that make the GPS constellation feel are, are so sensitive that if we didn't take general relativity into account, our GPS measurements would be off by about a mile at the end of each day. So if you're making very sensitive measurements in a place where gravity is weak, and GPS is an example of that, then you do need to take into account the fact that general relativity and New Newtonian gravity predict slightly different things. 
And for years, until about the 1960s, we didn't have any way of testing the difference with anything that was at all strong. We had three classical tests of general relativity. The first one was known before Einstein's time. Uh, and that was the fact that Mercury's orbit, there's the planet Mercury, doesn't close back on itself like it was predicted by Newtonian theory. But instead, as you can see, the ellipse so-called precesses, the main axis of the ellipse uh, goes around and comes back in a slightly different place. And this is such a tiny effect. It's, one, it's uh, 43 seconds of arc and a second of arc is a 36 hundredth of a degree. And this is every century. But astronomical measurements were sensitive enough that they were able to determine this discrepancy. And when Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity, he said, aha, this predicts exactly what Mercury is doing. The second classical test was the bending of light. Um, when you look at a star, you look straight toward it from Earth. But if there's a massive object between you and the star, like the sun, for example, you look in a slightly different direction because the light is bent by gravity in going past the sun. And there was a solar eclipse in 1919. And in order to see this effect, especially using the sun, um, you can't look at stars in the daytime, and yet the sun's right, sitting right there in the way. So the only times you can do it is during a solar eclipse. And there was this eclipse in 1919. Uh, and uh, this is what catapulted Einstein to fame because he had predicted this bending and that's exactly what occurred. And here we have this uh, sexist headline, men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations, Einstein theory triumphs, stars were not where they seemed or were calculated to be, but nobody need worry. So that's the second classical test, which happened in 1919. And then uh, there's something called gravitational time dilation, which tells us that time runs slower where gravity is stronger, kind of looks like this, two clocks and one of them is running uh, slower where gravity is stronger. And this was actually tested in 1960 by shooting a kind of electromagnetic radiation up a stairwell at Harvard University. And it was later tested by looking at very uh, stars that are called white dwarfs that are very dense and have somewhat strong gravity, but still weak in the general relativistic context. So let's talk a little bit about weak and strong gravity. Weak gravity is everywhere in our solar system. And here's a true false question. <clears throat> what goes up must come down. And the answer to that question is it's false. Because if you throw something fast enough from Earth, it will escape Earth's gravity forever and travel infinitely far from Earth. And the speed it takes to do that is called escape speed. And for Earth, it's about seven miles a second. And for the sun, it's a whopping 400 miles a second. That sounds fast, but both of those are tiny compared to the speed of light C, and which is 186,000 miles a second, 300,000 kilometers a second. And that's what determines whether gravity is strong or weak. In a region where the escape speed approaches the speed of light, then gravity is truly strong. And nowhere in our solar system is that the case. So space time is only slightly curved in our solar system. Strong gravity occurs when the escape speed approaches the speed of light, space-time becomes strongly curved, and the ultimate objects that reveal strong gravity are neutron stars, objects that are sort of like atomic nuclei, but maybe roughly the size of St. Johnsbury, since we're talking here in St. Johnsbury, about six miles across maybe, and then black holes, which vary in size depending on how much mass they have. Um, Black holes in our universe are common. When I was starting out as a graduate student, we didn't know for sure that they existed. Now we know for sure, and the 2020 Nobel Prize went to Andrea Goetz, Roger Penrose, and Reinhard Genzel for their work on black holes, especially at the centers of galaxies. Uh, we now know there are black holes in binary star systems, two stars in close orbits where one of them is a black hole. We know they're in galactic centers, and over here, uh, in this animation, you see uh, actual measured positions of stars. This is the year in the upper right, uh, measured positions of stars orbiting the very center of our galaxy where there's a massive black hole about 4 million times as massive as the sun. So we know almost every galactic center has a massive black hole. There might even be primordial black holes that formed at the beginning of the universe, and there might be other black holes, and in fact, the uh, gravitational wave observatories are turning up classes of black holes that we didn't previously know existed. So that's a quick look at where general relativity comes from. Now, general relativity until about, again, the 1960s or even later was this obscure 
branch of physics that people had no reason to believe was wrong, but wasn't particularly useful. But since about the second half to second a quarter of the 20th century, general relativity has become a tool in modern astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, one fascinating object is the so-called binary pulsar. Um, it was discovered by Joe Taylor and Russell Hulse at, then at the University of Massachusetts. Um, there are two neutron stars in close orbit. They're so close that this perihelion precession, which was a subtle thing for Mercury's orbit, is very obvious. And the orbits are changing as if the two uh, neutron stars are losing energy and the energy loss is consistent with there being gravitational waves. So uh, although um, they didn't actually detect gravitational waves, in a sense, it was an indirect detection that gravitational waves existed. Another place we use general relativity is in gravitational lensing. This is a more modern manifestation of the bending of light that was discovered in 1919. Light from distant objects passes, in this case, not near the sun, but near a massive galaxy, and multiple or distorted images of the objects are formed. And we use this now within our galaxy to detect dark, massive objects, including exoplanets uh, orbiting around distant stars. Um, it's also used in cosmology to discover, to, to study the distribution of dark matter. And in a broader sense, gravitational lenses act as enormous telescopes that allow us to observe very distant objects that would not be visible unless their light were focused by gravity. And here's how a gravitational lens works. Um, what I've got here is a massive galaxy. I've got the Earth where I've got observers and way in the distance I've got a quasar, which is actually a massive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Um, and it's giving out lots of uh, radiation that we can see as matter falls into that black hole. And if I'm on Earth and I want to see that quasar, because the light from the quasar bends going around the galaxy, I could look in this direction or this direction and see it. So I could look that way or I could look that way. And either way, I'd see the, the quasar and I'd see two images of it. Or if you think in three dimensions, if I rotate this around, uh, out of the plane of the picture, I might see a ring of the quasars looking in all kinds of different directions. And we have, since the 1970s and 80s and now into the night and then into the 90s, it became a big deal. We discovered lots of gravitational lenses which we're now using as um, astronomical observing objects. So here's an example of a, a, observa of a gravitational lens. This is an object called the Einstein cross. It's actually, uh, a distant quasar, and there are four distinct images of it that you can see here. They're being imaged by a, a galaxy, which is between the quasar and us. Um, the distance to the galaxy is about 500 million light years, and the distance to the quasar is about 9 billion light years, and the light from the quasar is being bent. It isn't perfectly symmetrical, so we don't see a ring of objects, but we see these four objects. And here's a so-called microlensing of the Einstein cross as a star passes in between in our own galaxy and it causes the different parts, the different images of the quasar. These are one, two, three, four images, one, two, three, four images of the same object. The thing in the middle is the distant galaxy. The galaxy is closer than the quasar. And they, they look different because different objects are passing in front of them and imaging this different images differently. Amazing. And here is another example. Um, we're looking here at a cluster of galaxies. The yellow things are cluster of galaxies. I, want, I don't want to say nearby, they're billions of light years away, but even further away is a more distant cluster of galaxies. And what you're seeing here is there's a blue thing sort of elongated and another one here and another one here and another one here and another one here and another one out here. And you could almost imagine these forming a ring as you would get in that picture I showed about light bending from a quasar around a massive galaxy. It isn't perfectly symmetric, but there's a hint of a ring and this and this and this and this and this and this and this, and this, and this are all images of the same object. And this and this and probably this are images of another object, a galaxy that's very, very far away and being imaged by these uh, by this distant cluster. Not as distant though as the objects being imaged. 
And finally, the most recent manifestation of gravitational waves is what I, of, gra of general relativity, are the gravitational waves that I start this talk with. And the gravitational waves are generated by two objects in motion. A single object would have trouble generating gravitational waves, but two objects going around each other will generate gravitational waves, which are literally ripples in the fabric of space time, and they propagate outward at the speed of light just like the ripples on a pond when you throw a, water, a, a rock into it and you see the ripples propagating outward. And the discovery we made in 2015 of gravitational waves with that LIGO detector, detecting changes in the length of the arms of that structure of that, the thing in Livingston, uh, Livingston Louisiana and Hanford, Washington, uh, the 10 thousandths the length, the 10 thousandths the diameter of a proton, that was detecting the very subtle ripples in the structure of space time itself. It wasn't so much that the, that the observing structure shrank as that space itself shrank a tiny, tiny bit as these gravitational waves came by. And today we detect gravitational waves as I showed at the beginning quite regularly. And they're almost all of them formed by pairs of black holes that have been in orbit around each other and we happen to observe them at the time that they spiral together and release a big burst of gravitational waves. So these are the kinds of gravitational waves we're seeing. They're coming from binary star systems, particularly binary black holes, but also on a rare occasion, we've seen binary neutron stars that came together and converged. Um, this isn't the only gravitational wave detector. Uh, there are a number of them being built around the world. But the most impressive one that's going to be built uh, probably in the 2030s is LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And this is a structure that consists of, of, of uh, three spacecraft. Um, they're in orbit um, between the Earth and the Sun. They are um, 2,500, 2,500,000 kilometers apart. That's about uh, 1,500,000 miles. That's more than 1% of the distance to the sun. So this is a big object. And laser beams are going to bounce back and forth between these three spacecraft. And subtle changes in the positions of the spacecraft relative to each other as gravitational waves go by will be detected. And that's how we'll know uh, that gravitational waves have happened. Um, the, there is actually a test experiment for this running right now in Earth orbit. To, as a proof of concept of the detectors that are going to be put in these spacecraft. But this is a very large, expensive experiment. Uh, this one is going to be largely developed by the European Space Agency. OK, well, I'm just about out of time. And I want to end with sort of a, a philosophical look at um, what I call the new astronomy, sort of the evolution of some of our windows on the universe, in which the last one are these gravitational waves I've talked about in the context of general relativity. So perhaps our first um, window on the universe opened up when Galileo took optical telescopes, which he did not invent, but used and aimed them at the heavens and saw a whole lot of things like Jupiter's moons, which he made, made him realize uh, there were miniature solar systems elsewhere in the universe. That was in 1609. Uh, fast forward to about 1830, and we developed for the first time the ability to view infrared radiation. Infrared is um, light that is redder than red, if you will. It's also the energy that the Earth is trying to get rid of, which is being trapped and uh, can't escape due, due to global warming. But infrared is emitted by a number of objects in the universe. And infrared astronomy was first developed around the 1830s. Radio astronomy developed in the 1930s uh, with the detection of various strange noises in radio communications telescopes. And it was soon recognized that these were coming from the cosmos. And people began building radio antennas that could detect radio signals coming from throughout the cosmos. And each of these opens up a new window on the universe and on different physical phenomena that are occurring. Because not all physical phenomena give off visible light. Merging black holes don't. They only give off gravitational radiation. Uh, many other things, electrons spiraling around magnetic fields in distant galaxies or in the intergalactic medium, they give off radio waves. They don't give off visible light. So each of these opens up a new window. Uh, gamma ray astronomy came along in 1961, where we could see gamma rays, the, the high energy rays emitted by atomic nuclei. Um, X-ray astronomy came along in 1962. Um, I started graduate work in about 1972. Uh, 
partly because X-ray astronomy had come along and it had become an exciting new field. This is an X-ray picture of the sun, which is one of the objects I've studied. Neutrino astronomy arrived in 1968. We were able to detect these elusive particles called the neutrinos. Uh, this is a neutrino detector on the right here. Um, it's a huge tank of water. This one is in Japan and the water uh, gives off visible light when um, neutrinos come through it and interact with the atoms, which happens very rarely. And so now we're able to study events that occur in the universe that give us uh, neutrinos. And finally, gravitational wave astronomy came into being in 2016. And this is an entirely different kind of astronomy. Uh, neutrino astronomy and gravitational wave astronomy do not rely on electromagnetic waves, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet waves, light waves, infrared, microwaves, radio waves, and so on. Those are all the things here in green are electromagnetic waves similar to visible light, but different wavelengths. And so they come from different physical processes. But these last two are entirely different areas of physics and gravitational wave astronomy in the five years we've known it has taught us amazing amounts about the universe. And so I will stop there and be ready for questions. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. I guess we're taking, are we taking questions in the chat? How are we doing this? Oh, I see, okay. My chat, uh, my chat uh, doesn't seem to work. I don't know why. Okay, I only see three things in the chat. So let let me just um, see if I got sure. questions, and then I'll take them from the floor. Uh, nobody. Well, George Belrose has a question, which I will answer subsequently. Um, so who had a question? Somebody did. I did. I don't okay, know about other people. Now this may seem very naive. I'm not a physicist, obviously. But I've always wondered for some time, why wherever we are on a round planet, do we perceive that it's flat and that we can always stand upright? What, what, I know it has something to do with gravity, but I've never understood what exactly it has to do with gravity. Okay, so there are two questions there. One is why we stand upright. That's pretty easy because gravity is attracting us to the center of the earth. So wherever we are on earth, okay. um, Gravity is attracting us. By the way, that's not a trivial statement. Newton had to invent calculus to prove that a spherical object acts as if it was all concentrated at its center. Um, now that isn't quite true. For example, my geologist colleagues have a device called a gravimeter that measures very delicate changes in gravity. And when they do experiments in Middlebury, Vermont, their gravimeter is slightly attracted to the Green Mountains to our east. But to the extent that the Earth is a sphere, we all stand vertically on that sphere. And if we don't stand vertically, the way we stand is by definition vertical. That's the way gravity is going. So that was your second question. Uh, your first question was the more interesting one, and I'm forgetting what it was. It was, uh, what was it? Yeah, the uh, first question was, why do we perceive wherever we are? Oh. Okay. Okay, yeah. That, why that, do we that, perceive everything is flat? flat? Okay, so, so suppose you were, um, you know, how big is the Earth, Ron? Do you know how big it is? Frankly, no. It's about 8,000 miles in diameter. If we had okay. more time and I were in a class, I would have you figure that out by asking you how far <laughs> is it, California, and how, you, know, you could figure this out. It's about 8,000 miles in diameter. So the answer to your question is you are tiny compared to the size of the Earth. But imagine if you were, uh, if you were 1,000 miles tall. You would see the curvature of the Earth. It would be quite obvious. Astronauts notice that as soon as they get up. Now you can also notice that if you stood in a perfectly flat desert and you climbed up on a rock or something, the horizon that you could see would be noticeably further than if you didn't climb up on that rock and it would be noticeably less if you sit down. And it's a fairly easy uh, problem in about uh, ninth and 10th grade geometry to calculate that effect. And you're, you're looking out over say the ocean how far away is the horizon? It depends quite dramatically on how high your eyes are off the ground. So there are subtle places where you can detect the fact that the earth is round. But the basic reason it looks flat to you is because you're very small compared to the curvature scale of the earth. And what you see is either the flatness or the local irregularities. Unless you start looking at the horizon and thinking about it, you don't notice that earth is curved. Other questions? If no one has, 
if no one has another question, I have another one. I've always wondered another thing. What about the revolutions and the rotations of Earth make people and other animals and plants also get older and look older and, and lose their what they had when they were young, their, their abilities? That has nothing to do with the rotation of the Earth or revolution of the Earth around the sun, unless you think of that as a, a measure of time. And so that's marking time. But the fact that the Earth is going around the sun has nothing to do with with our aging. People uh, on a spaceship heading to a distant planet or distant solar system would um, age equally well. The rate of aging might vary relative to you because of relativity effects, but there's nothing about the motion of the Earth around the sun that causes us to age. So what does cause us to age? Biology. I'm a physicist, but somebody who's a biologist <laughs> might that better. I'll ask my doctor. Yeah. There's a question, uh, a person with his hand raised in the chat, David Rosenberg. David Rosenberg, I'm, welcome. I'm going to ask uh, him to unmute and then we'll let him ask his question live. I think we'll cut to the chase faster. Um, All right. Am I unmuted? Okay. You are unmuted, sir. Okay. Hi, Rich. Hi, David. Are you in Washington? Uh, no, I'm sitting in uh, Middlebury, Vermont at the moment. Just came back. Uh, my question is inspired by your last slide, and it suggested to me that what we know about the universe depends on what technology we use to observe the universe, and it has changed frequently. Uh, what new technologies are likely to come along to give us what new views of the universe? Wow, that's an excellent question and a very perceptive observation because had we only had the visible light we can see with our eyes, our picture of the universe would be much less rich than it is. Um, I'm probably gonna be unimaginative in answering your question because now that we can see across the entire electromagnetic spectrum from the lowest frequency radio waves up to gamma rays, we've got the whole electromagnetic spectrum covered. We can see neutrinos which are probably the most common particles in the universe, uh, and uh, we know how to see them. And we can now see gravitational waves, and I'm trying to think if there's something else out there that we haven't yet seen, and I'm off the top of my head not thinking of anything, you know, some brand new physics that's generating some brand new signal, unless our understanding of physics is incomplete, which it might be. So that's a rather unimaginative answer. I know there are physicists out there looking, you know, for instance, um, uh, I was just reading about um, muon astronomy. Muons are another kind of subatomic particle. Um, mm. And you can do astronomy with muons by looking at sources of them, but that's not fundamentally different than doing it with neutrinos. It's a technically different thing. So, you know, there may be other kinds of particles being generated out there. I mean, we do cosmic ray astronomy also. I didn't even mention that. Uh, with these high energy particles coming from space. But I don't see, now that we've got gravitational waves, I don't see some big new window based on entirely new physics opening up. But my colleague, um, Elot Glickman at, at Middlebury who studies black holes, she might have a better answer to that question than I do. Okay, thank you. Other questions? George Belros, I'm gonna go after yours briefly. George wants to know why C.P. Snow's book from the 1950s, The Two Cultures, is important. It's important because it brings science and humanity together, science and the humanities together. This is, I think the only reason the Vermont Humanities uh, has me do talks on relativity is because it's so close to the philosophical edge of physics. I've offered to give my talk on uh, photovoltaics and the solar revolution in Vermont, and that's not humanities enough for the Vermont humanities. So somewhere there's a, a distinction there. But uh, George, I think that's important. I am preparing a talk, which I will give in several places next year, um, um, which is going to be called, um, what's it going to be called? It's going to be called CP Snow and Your Heat Pump or something like that. And it's gonna talk about CP Snow's two cultures. And it's gonna talk about all these heat pumps that everybody's putting on their houses these days and how on earth are they related. So stay tuned. Other questions? God, I have some I, questions. 
Well, I have a question. <laughs> I can't seem to put it in the chat. Um, but, um, and it relates to this new one. I was just talking about that, those muons when you were saying that. And um, because then the physicist was looking at, at least in the New York Times, it was saying that there's a possible, possible fifth physical force. They're changing the standard model. Yeah. Is that not yeah. possible? Or? <laughs> no, that's possible. There, you know, this keeps happening. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was something new about a possible fifth force. And people look for a possible fifth force by studying. I, let me back up. There are physicists recognize four forces. They actually recognize only three fundamental forces. And a goal of physics is to unite them all. And the three forces they recognize are uh, the strong force that holds atomic nuclei together, holds quarks together, actually. Um, the electroweak force, which comprises electricity and magnetism that are familiar to us, and also something called the weak nuclear force, which is sometimes treated separately, but those have been joined, we understand how they connect. And the third one is gravity, which we really, uh, even though it's so obvious to us, it is in some ways the least understood and we don't know how to merge these. So there's a talk of a possible fourth or fifth force, depending on how you like to count them. And people looking at cosmological situations look for evidence of it. And people doing experiments, very sensitive experiments with gravity right here on earth, also look for deviations from Newtonian gravity on earth as evidence for a fifth force. I think you're gonna see uh, these New York Times articles about a possible fifth force and they're gonna keep coming up and keep coming up and keep coming up. My guess is they're gonna go away because I don't think there is this fifth force, but there may be. And if there is, of course, that opens a whole new window on the universe trying to discover what particles are associated with this fifth force and how they're coming to us from out in the distant cosmos. But I, I wouldn't hold your breath on it, but that's just my, my uh, opinion, and I'm not a professional on studying the fifth course. Okay. But it's well, a good thank question. You. <laughs> now there's a guy who's written about physics professors. Hi, Mark. Read Mark Estrin's book, um, Lamentations of Julius Morantz, about a fictional Middlebury College physics professor, and you'll be in for a treat. <laughs> Other questions? What is time? Oh, don't get me going on that. I don't know. And um, when I taught my course, oh, there's Zach. There's one of my former students. Hi, Zach. Um, I, when I taught my course uh, in, in, it was called, um, well, the, the video course is called Einstein's Relativity and the Quantum Revolution, Modern Physics for Non-Scientists. That wasn't its name at Middlebury. Uh, when I taught that course, the first assignment was to um, get a quote about space and a quote about time that gave some sense of what these were about. And a lot of people came up with some quotes of Einstein where he sort of thought of time as a mountain range that, that, that actually existed and we sort of moved our way through it and all. I have no idea what time is. I really don't. Um, I'm a believer in free will, so that means I don't think the future is fixed. So I don't think there's actually a four dimensional continuum that is already in place with every event that ever was and is ever going to be. But I can't really justify that in terms of physics. That's sort of more a philosophical viewpoint. So I have no idea what time is. I think it's one of the most elusive concepts, um, clearly important to us. It's different from space because we can move at will in any of the three dimensions of space but we're carried along inexorably in one direction toward the future in time. I don't know what time is. Anybody have any ideas? No answers. Other questions? You guys are quiet. Apparently people can unmute themselves, but if anybody wants to speak and they can't, um, put your hand up if you can do that and we'll unmute you and- There's a whitehead question coming. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, talking about time, this is just, you know, uh, it may not be relevant, but isn't time our perception of the progression of moments as we travel? Because we're always traveling. 
No, we, we never stop traveling. Yes. Uh, but is it just our perception? And if it is, what's it our perception of? If you believe that it's us just moving from moment to moment, um, then you're sort of suggesting these moments already exist and we're just ticking them along. No, no, and no. I find that incompatible with free will. No, no. I'm what I what I what I mean is uh, <laughs> the uh, the motion of the Earth, the motion of the the universe, and uh, uh, all of that. It's all moving, and that movement uh, creates our perception of time because because the, the movement takes. It's like a progression of movement, and we perceive this progression of moments. And that's, you know, we're we're like specks of dust in the universe, but this is how we we perceive it. So right. If nothing, if there were no movement, we would probably wouldn't experience time. Right. Right. That's what I'm. Right. That's what I'm thinking. And, and as I always say when I'm teaching relativity, think about motion. We're going to talk about motion in relativity. All that stuff was, you know, motion doesn't matter same physics for all states of motion. Motion is important because to move is to move through space and also through time. So you're absolutely right. Um, without, without motion, there would be no perception of time and maybe no time at all. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of thinking because we're just part of this uh, space-time continuum, right? So, yeah, well... All right. Thanks a lot. I very, you really coming. enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? You know, I'm still still unresolved because that's what I was wondering. I know obviously everybody knows about the movement and the rotations and the, but why would that um, foster um, an impression uh, of time or is time actually an illusion or something like that? I personally uh, don't think it's an illusion, but there are people who do. Um, I guess if there were no change, I think, I think it's, it's change that's important for perceiving time. If things are always the same, then it's always the same moment, it seems like. But it's pretty hard to imagine existing without there being change. I mean, can you imagine a sentient being that never changed? I don't know. Professor Wilson, I think we have reached the end. That was one of the most fascinating talks I've ever seen. Speaking for myself as a lay person who knows little about the subject, I know a lot more now. And I do hope the Humanities Council is going to broadcast this presentation because it it was a winner. Okay. If you don't if you don't broadcast this one, you've got the a live version of it that you have broadcast on occasion from, yes. my, from I think Rutland. And I want CP Snow and uh, heat bombs, you can do that here. <laughs> that's that's so great uh johnny flood any uh, ending remarks just here here i would say bob that was incredible to listen to and really yeah if time is anything it's a little cruel because time is up and thank you thank you for so having long. me and thank you all for coming i appreciate your questions thank you thanks very so much. much thanks Good night. okay good night everyone thank you